Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Summer and Jamie from the Dolls of Horror podcast. Hey. And everyone, please give it up for Mr. Bill Johnson from Texas Chainsaw, part two. Thanks, glad by the interlocutors. <laughs> Is that you mean? <laughs> yeah! Woo! Come on, guys! I know, give us a little bit here. <laughs> so, so we need to do this over again. Bill Johnson! Yeah! <laughs> yes. <laughs> Prepare. Oh, they're wrong. So, ah. how's the con treating you so far? I know it just started, but. Wunderbar. Yes, good, good, good. Um, so I think, you know, uh, we got a lot of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 fans in the room. So tell us a little bit about what it was like stepping into such an iconic character. Thank you for your question. Uh, the overall part was it was, uh, it was very exciting and fun to do, and it was grueling. And um, it was... Uh, The chaos you saw was going on all the time. <laughs> when the scene was off, when the scene was on, it was chaotic. So uh, it was challenging um, and uh, very you know, rewarding artistically, certainly. Are you a horror fan yourself before you started this movie? Um, I I started in the live theater, and essentially that's like a religion. You spend all your time in church or the theater. Mm -hmm. So I didn't watch TV much or go to the movies. I was busy, you know, reading plays and, you know, auditioning and trying out. But uh, when I was auditioning for this, I got a call from the agency. And they said, it's a sequel to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And... Uh, they want someone who looks like Baby Huey. I don't know if anybody here knows Baby <laughs> Huey. You know Baby Huey. Yes. <laughs> Baby Huey is like a six foot six duck in a diaper and, you know, a, a mop hat. A mop hat and uh, is uh, kind of shaped like a bowling uh, pin. <laughs> like me, when I stand up, you'll see it. So, uh, a gunner was like that, so they were looking for someone with the same profile. And I uh, had not seen the movie. I was going to audition in, like in two days, so I rented it, watched it, regretted it, not regretted, <laughs> but it was, I was frightened. I, some, and it was, I couldn't put my finger on it, but I just checked all the locks and the windows. <laughs> It's amazing how psychologically subtle that movie that movie is. And at the time, it was you know the way ahead. And the photography, wow, the photography. For Mr. Pearl, I hope we have him in here someday. Maybe oh, one day. That would be amazing. There's to me the original has like a almost like a voyeurism to it. it feels like something you shouldn't be watching, and it's delightful. <laughs> I like that feeling. <laughs> I'm in complete agreement. <laughs> and you know, um, tell us like what are some of your favorite memories from filming? Well. <clears throat> Um, and what did I come up? Oh, well, of course, the, um, the rats on the table, that was hilarious. Um, dinner table and all the crawdads, they released the rats and they went over and ate the crawdads alive. That was, they were screaming little tiny screams. It was horrible. And then, then they ate all of them. <laughs> So I thought, well, it's a movie within a movie about the movie. So, as the man said, uh, it's a dog eat dog world. Some days there just ain't enough damn dog. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> this is what you thought. I'm reminded of a story. 
Oh, it's, oh yeah, this is, uh, Father Murphy is finishing up mass and in comes Mary McCarthy looking sad. And Father goes up to her and says, Mary, what's the matter? This all father, my husband passed over last night. Oh, oh, says Father, it's terrible. Well, did he, did he have any last wishes? Well, yes, he did, Father. Well, what was it? Well, well, he said, Mary, put down the gun. <laughs> but I'm <pumped. laughs> That is a smirker, isn't it? <laughs> Do you have any um, memories or stories of filming with Dennis Hopper? <laughs> That's a yes. Yep, yeah. <laughs> Everyone has memories or stories of filming with him, and I love to hear them. Uh, Dennis, a very unique artist. I mean, you know his work, and uh, who knew he could sing? You know, bringing in the sheep. Bring. Okay, I thought it was pretty great, and uh, I thought he sang very well, and he sang a very nice interpretation for this film. Uh, the, the thing that I found um, funny was that uh, Bill Mosley, um, Dennis, and, and me, we were in the makeup getting, it was at the end of the, you know, the, we were wrapped and uh, we were being uh, pulled out of makeup. And we were waiting for the makeup people to show up and uh, Bill was cracking jokes right and left. I asked Dennis, hey man, well, why did you, you know, what prompted you to, to, to direct the uh, to make uh, the movie uh, Easy Rider, his you know huge movie, be very you know uh, influential. And he said, "Well, I just wanted to make a movie." Mm, okay, so we're laughing some more, and then and then I figure I'm gonna blind, I'm gonna hit him with a, a line from the movie, one of his lines, and see if he knows it. So he's laughing, right? And all of a sudden, I turn over and says, Hey, man, you can't arrest us. He's Captain America, and I'm Billy. And he goes, and we've been working fairs up and down the coast for big money, too. Like, like 30 years hadn't gone by. It was, and, and Mosley and me fell on the floor pissing ourselves because it was just too perfect. It was just too perfect. Just turned it on, just like that, yeah. like nothing had happened. Oh my gosh. So, you know, we were really interested. We saw a credit, um, a credit that you were involved in, a new movie that's going around, I think, the film festivals right now, The Once and Future Smash. What can you tell us about that? Nothing. <laughs> I, this is the first time I've heard about it. Your credit is playing yourself. Credit is playing yourself. What? <laughs> it looks it looks kind of like it's a um, like a mockumentary or something, but mm -hmm. it, it, it features a lot of footage from cons. Yeah. Uh, you were listed in there as playing yourself, as well as some oh, other folks who, who too. Made it, you know? Ooh, should have written that down. I'm not sure who made it, but Michael St. Michael is in it. Um, who else did we Adam see? Adam Marcus, that we've noticed because we love me some Adam. Lloyd Kaufman. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, okay. Well, it's some kind of mockumentary and <laughs> you have a credit in it. And we saw the trailer and we have to see it and now we really have to see it. <laughs> I mean, uh, if I was going to promote a film, it would be uh, Butcher's Bluff. Uh, I have a cameo in there. Uh, uh, William N. Stone's the director and the, and the lead character, the Hog Man. It's a new horror character and he's, oh, he's coming for you. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Yes, he, he's a good boy. Where can we see that? Um, is it streaming? Is it out? Well, if you want to travel to Austin, uh, Texas, it'll be uh, having its third premiere there in um, December, early December. Okay. And uh, um, but then I guess it'll be coming out in video at some time. Yeah. But it's just, you know, he it's just finished it. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. That's exciting. He's a, he's a really fresh director. He writes, he directs, he acts. 
He's a triple threat, and we're all happy to be threatened by him. Yeah. yeah. So we also noticed that in your credits, you were credited as um, being a composer and also working in the music department in some films. Yes. Uh, can you tell us about doing that? Oh, I'd love to, if only it were true. Yeah. Lies, they lied to you. I no, I, I, you know, because they credited me with things that aren't mine, like working with uh, Mr. Sorbo as as Hercules. Or, really? Yeah. Mm. Some Bill Johnson won, not me though. <laughs> and I tried had to your them, picture. It's not me, and they don't care. They have to go do their own research. Wow. So for a little while, I had. I would to, write that though and say it was very nice composing things. I am a genius. Yes, Thank I'll you. I'll hum you a few tunes. <laughs> don't anyone go away. It only take about ninety minutes. <laughs> Well, okay, um, you know, tell us a little bit about um, what you enjoy about doing these cons because, of course, we love that you're here. Tell us what you love about being here with all these horror people. Um, I love the circus. And these cons are like the circus cube. <laughs> Everything you could want. And it's all happening at the same time. That's really great. And, you know, meet folks who are, you know, enthusiastic and, you know, and happy and uh, they're into what they're doing. And I like doing the drawing. I like the, the artistic feel of, you know. So that, that's fun, you know. It's, it's just been fun. So, what you really want to hear? You want to hear the dirt, right? You want well, to hear the filthy stuff. We do have a couple of more things that we have to know about, okay? <clears throat> first of all, again, internet rumors. Internet, internet rumors, but first of all, I read on the internet you were an acting teacher at some point. Mm -hmm. So that was true, right? Yes. Sir. When did that happen? Are you still doing it? Um. 1975, I started teaching acting classes at the Zachary Scott Theater Center in Austin, Texas. And I did that for about 30 years. And uh, the acting programs changed. Uh, budgets changed. There, you know, people run things, new rooms, that sort of thing. Um, I still uh, like doing uh, acting classes because it's about, you know, finding out where you are in your body, on the planet, in time. Whoa. So are you teaching on your own now at all, or? Um... Uh, no, organizing that is incredibly, you need a staff yeah. for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I have impromptu, I've done a few impromptu acting classes um, at Cora conventions, as, uh, oh. you know, something we get some people together and we improvise, you know, and play improv games. And it was a lot of fun. It's easy if you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. you know? well, that sounds divine. I think next time we have you out, we should probably talk to the boss man about arranging something like that if you want oh, to. Oh boy, we that would be so much time. fun, right? Yeah. I would yeah. love that, man. That's something yeah. has to happen, right? Yeah, you get all these folks championing you in doing what you're doing and they're all joining in and you're synergizing before long you're amazed and you're laughing and then you're yeah. hungry let's go out pancakes it's good yeah it's beautiful um and you know um i was also wondering what is a piece of work that you've done that you're really really proud of um besides texas chainsaw massacre too Because I want to see more of you. Uh, thank you. Um, I might be put in the category of sort of a one-hit wonder. Like this is the movie that I was in. I was I have not been in a lot of films. Um, some indies, uh, John by William Instone. I had you know some some really great parts. Um, but I'm thinking of some of the some of the comedies I've done that. I really, you know, on stage, I've done some some new uh, some new plays and created roles in them, and and that was fun. It's fun when people kind of go, "Aha! I love doing that." To be 
going aha and have others going aha at the same time. Because there's just not enough aha for me. And uh, usually in the theater is the place you're really going after it. Jamie and I are both really big theater nerds. Huge. Yeah. Yes. For me, especially musicals, um, huge. I, I throw out a musical reference at least once a day and no one ever gets it, but I get it. It makes me happy, you know? <laughs> okay, I got Ado Annie and uh, we could do Oklahoma. <laughs> I'll, be Lori, I'll be Dream Lori because I could do the ballet. <laughs> oh, the ballet. I'll, I'll be Dream Lori. You take care of that part. Oh, excellent. <laughs> and we both can't say no. So. Well, you name the musical, I'll come, I'll join in. Oh, homework for next time. <laughs> so now, okay, one more question, or maybe a stream of questions before we turn it over to some audience questions. Now, speaking of the internet, <clears throat> we found some stuff and we did not think it was true, but we thought it was freaking hilarious. So we wanted to read it and confirm or deny. Um, okay, easy stuff. You're a Sagittarius. Good, me too. Okay. Um, you often dance and do Chai Chi. Both true? Oh, I love awesome. it. Prefers to read poetry, science fiction, and suspense thrillers. I do enjoy them a great deal. <laughs> oh, I love this. This is a good site. Jamie, I don't know where you found it, but they're actually Larry accurate. Larry Niven, Ring World, read it. All right. Oh. Um, and your favorite music is classical opera, guitar, soft folk, and soft rock blues. That's that was quite a list. <laughs> I have a wide variety. My, my dad built a, a stereo uh, set, you know, speakers, and he built everything. And uh, then he, he bought like classical music. So I listened to that, a lot of that, as I was growing up. And then. Uh, and then the teens, you know, and then we had the Beatles, and then you know, the Stones, and then we got deeper into it. But I still love me a good evening of Telemann, some uh, table music while we're chatting. Really kind of picks, makes the brain go, like Mozart, right? Yeah. Mozart makes your brain light up. And, yeah. So it's, uh, and uh, you know, if you want to put on the dark side of the moon, I'm there. Oh, if you want to hear Rammstein, yeah, I'll hear some Rammstein. Jamie, who would have thought that that site that you found that seems so, like, false was more true than IMDb? I think it was called, like, People Pill. Um, Good. I know. And they actually were right. That's thrilling. And I got to piggyback off of that music question. Um, favorite musical? I know that's, like... I got so many. Stop the world, I want to get off. That's a good one. Isn't that foobab, rhubab? <laughs> um, I God, I love music so much. Um, all those great musicals are all great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how do you pick yeah. one? I know. Um, it all I depends on my mood. Men of La Mancha yeah. is a great one because I love the story. Yeah. This, Poor teacher retired and his brain dried up and he decided he would right all the wrongs in the world. He would go forth and destroy evil. Was it autobiographical? To you. And now, <laughs> he's no longer <laughs> Don Quixote de la Mancha. Mum, 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 mum. Hear me now, old oblique and unbearable world. Thou would be sound botched as can be, and so on. Um, oh, I, I could listen all stuff. night long. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, some enchanted evening. Oh, yeah. Or, uh, uh, time is fleeting. <laughs> Madness takes control. Great musical. We just referenced Rocky Horror at the last panel. Yeah, that's what, that's what that one, by the way, is one of my all time favorites. Not the movie, I love the movie, but the stage show um, as it was before the movie. Mm. Very close, of course, but I love the additional song they have in it um, that they didn't put in the movie, and I love it all. That's my favorite, one of my favorite shows yes. ever. And uh, the most beautiful message of all, especially for us horror lovers don't dream it, be it. 
right? Yeah. Dream it. Yes, it's told to us by uh, the poet. Uh, T.S. Eliot. Something to the effect of uh, those who make the rules are afraid of men who dream with their eyes open so that they may make it happen. That's paraphrasing, but that's the message. That's a good message. Isn't it though? It sure is. Oh my God. Any questions? Any comments? Oh, come on, guys. We gave you plenty. Any reviews? Any points of view? <laughs> any jokes? I could talk musicals all night, but I know you don't want to hear about that. Okay, Someone Danny, take it away. I know we got more. <laughs> yeah, so going back to Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, since we love that movie so much, um, what would you say was the most challenging aspect of it? You said it was kind of chaos the whole time, but what was the most challenging aspect of it? Uh, for me, it was... Um close to the end of the film I got pneumonia and I was in bed for a week taking meds every two hours coming close to the rainbow bridge it's really pretty but I don't want to go there yet and uh, then coming back from that and then jumping in so it was, uh, they were um, about a week away from the end of the film so, um, the smokehouse scene, I was, uh, that was uh, going to be a my scene, but Bob stepped in for that. So, uh, so it was around that time. So that was the hardest thing, was trying to just live through that. And how, how did you, like, through oh that, like, empower through? Did you just sleep a lot, or did they um, help you out? Did they get you meds? What's up? They asked me whether I wanted to go to the hospital or be at home, and I wanted to stay at home. Fortunately, I had a chaise lounge that was made out of like industrial aircraft aluminum and it was really strong, big and strong. So I laid down on that with a mattress and face down and then I had a, a, a vaporizer underneath it so it could come up in my face and I could just breathe that while I was reclined and that helped break it, you know, break everything up. As it was, it was doctor. That's the worst case of pneumonia I've seen in my life, my career. You're like, thanks. You're like, oh, I don't want to be the best at this particular thing. <laughs> yes, but I, I licked it, so I should. Or, doctor's not alive now. <laughs> if he were, I, I'd let him know. <laughs> and I'd love to know too, what was it like the first time that you saw the finished product when you first watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2? Uh, that was uh, in New York City with Bill Mosley. And uh, the theater was maybe third full during the day. And uh, we were stunned by what we saw. I, you know, we'd done so much footage and, and we saw what Toby had selected to be in it. And uh, we were, you know, we were stunned. The, uh, we were listening for the audience and the audience kind of were, you know, enjoying it some. But for the day, it was a pretty violent movie for the day it came. I uh, was interviewed in Austin by a talk show and they were going, well, how does it feel to be in a slasher film? With all that gore and, you know, trying to blindside me on that one. Well, it is a fantasy. Yeah. It's on the f screen. It's not real people documentary. Yeah. And uh, we were promoting love over violence. <laughs> Make love, not war. Family values. Yes, yes, and, and the question, uh, what is sex? Well, no one knows, really. <laughs> we think we know, and we keep messing up. But it's, it's worth practicing. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Do you have a most fun scene to shoot, or was it all very, very difficult? What's it all? 
most fun scene to shoot? Do you have one? Oh yeah. It was uh, playing opposite Caroline. Uh, in that specific scene or other times? <laughs> that specific scene. That was a group process. Everybody behind the camera was helping out on that one. <laughs> Everybody wanted a piece of that uh, scene. <laughs> yeah, Toby was uh, uh, directing me from uh, you know, the chair. He was talking and telling me exactly what was going on. That made it great, you know? So, what's that over there? Your brother's... The... Okay, your brother's over there. Okay, turn your attention back on her. That's it. <laughs> the one thing he surprised me a little bit. Get that chainsaw. A higher. We'll have an X rating here for Christ's sake. <laughs> and then when someone at uh, it was at uh, Cinema Wasteland for the 30th anniversary of the first movie, uh, we were all there. Caroline was there. Someone asked, um, "Did what did that saw feel like in your nether regions?" Caroline said promptly. That saw never touched my nethers. <laughs> and they didn't. So, uh, that, yeah. I mean, that was edgy, right? Was that an edgy scene? Good pun. Okay, everybody's kind of going, yeah, that was edgy. Okay. And you know, um, it's it's so fascinating to me, like Texas Chainsaw and Texas Chainsaw 2 have such a legacy. And I feel like Texas Chainsaw 2 really has like its own special legacy. Um, and it's so it's such an interesting film because it's got some separation between it and the original. And it kind of takes a, a little bit more of a comedic turn. Tell me what it kind of is like, what it feels like just being part of this movie and part of this franchise that people love so much. Why don't you ask me what the purpose of life is? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. Same, <laughs> same difference. The purpose of life, according to Picasso, take notes. <laughs> is to uh, find your gift and then... Uh, the meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose is to give it away. Like that. Yeah. Oftentimes, I believe uh, Pablo would pay for a meal by doing a doodle for the waiter. Yeah. The waiter said, thank you very much, and moved on to dessert. <laughs> um, so, uh, to others have tried the film franchise to work it, and no one has Toby's spin. Um, I think Richard Corris, the cinematographer too, uh, said it best. He said, Toby makes a very personal film and it can't really be held to standard timetables as, you know, uh, the bean counters would like. Uh, and uh, so I think the closest directors come to, to capturing the, the 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 sense of essence of uh, Toby's is uh, the third one Jeff Burr's uh, Jeff Burr a great director he also directed and I recommend this film uh, straight into darkness and uh, he works with a mask there you'll be interested to see that it would be nice it's a wonderful film, it has a great message, and uh, like, definitely worth a watch, definitely. And Jeff really got the sense of the heart of the story that is often, you know, it's, it's missed. Um, because all the hearts in the Sawyer family are bleeding and wounded. And... Uh, so, if all life is sorrowful, how do you deal with the sorrow? We sing and dance and eat. <laughs> so, did you, did you watch the sequels? Or did you stop at a certain moment instead of not watching any more of these? Um, let's see, I, kinda, I think I stopped at the fourth one. So, you saw the fourth one and then stopped? 
or you stopped before that? I saw the third one uh, with R.A. And I saw the fourth one uh, with Robbie Jacks as Leatherface. He was, you know, all the Leatherfaces from Austin. Isn't that weird? Yeah, oh, they know how to make them in Austin. Yeah, we know where to show up to get cast. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what the hell was I talking about? Uh, you saw the fourth one? Oh yeah, I saw the fourth one. I was approached to do it and I, I decided not to because it just, it wasn't a, a SAG film. And it was going to be done in the winter. There was not going to be a stunt double. There was not going to be enough budget to keep you in a place that was warm. <laughs> so I figured, I had enough of the other one. So this is, so I passed on it. And I, I, uh, I tried to work the one with uh, the remake, the first remake. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I watched the one. Uh, the, the other one I liked was with uh, uh, Dan Yeager as Leatherface. Uh, 3D, I think it was, Leatherface 3. And Marilyn Burns did the most beautiful oral um, interpretation of a letter she wrote about her character. She's such a brilliant actress. But the odd thing I found that even though I didn't know any of the cast members when they did the movie. I had gone to school with all of them except Gunner, Edwin, and Bill Vale, um, Marilyn. Uh, I think that was, that was, uh, I didn't know Johnny Dugan. And, but Gunner went to UT, but he was like in the English department. You know, Gunner, he had like a Mensa IQ. Yeah, he was brilliantly smart. He could talk physics, math with anyone. And he spoke Finnish, which I believe is the language of the, mm, <clears throat> the Vikings. And uh, it's a complex language. Well, there's a lot of pieces. He said, well, it's very simple if you know all the pieces. <laughs> then he went through them, and the memory that he had was just astounding to me. I just loved hearing him talk about all the things he remembered. Ah, fine fellow. I just didn't know him long enough. I'm just... Here's something pretty funny. When I first met him, it was at the reunion of the first movie's 30 year at Cinema Wasteland, and I asked him to sign my program. And he did, and he handed it back. <laughs> he wrote to Bill, even though you're number two, you'll always be number one to me. <laughs> How funny is that? <laughs> I so, shook his hand on that one. <laughs> that was hilarious. So piggybacking off of that, have you seen the other ones? Because, you know, sometimes I'll talk to people who were in a sequel and they would never seen the other ones, past or present or after, because um, they're frightened maybe. Did you have a favorite Leatherface interpretation? Would it be Gunner or maybe one of the other ones besides yourself? Um, Gunner. Yeah. Gunner. Uh, Toby said the first one was a comedy, but nobody got that. <laughs> So he got a kit uh, together with Kit Carson. Um, you may see he's a performer in uh, Running On Empty. Uh, he's a very, very good actor and a hell of a writer. And uh, they got the comedy in there. So they wanted it. We, they won't know whether uh, to laugh or she to go blind. That's all right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And is there any kind of, do you have any kind of like dream projects, whatever that might be, whether it's music related, book related, film related, whatever it might be that you're interested in doing still? Uh, yes. This is not related to film or, but it is artistic. It's more science and engineering. 2022. The solar system of Earth 
has been undergoing assault from the galactic currency for over 40 years. The sun was heating up. It was in its 11 year maximum cycle of solar sunspots and the Earth's magnetic field that was the shields to radiation are weakening. They're down by 20% and dropping. What will happen eventually is that the magnetic pole is doing, if you're looking at the top of the Earth, the pole is doing this. It's moving around. The magnetic pole is moving around. Sometimes there are multiple poles. And when this is called magnetic excursion, and when this happens long enough, the Earth will tilt 90 degrees. What will happen then is that the oceans will sweep over the continents, and they'll wash back, and then the other side will come back over the continents and wash back. That's what's coming. My part in this is, I have found a way to stop it. And your minds will be blown when I tell you why and how. The pyramids of Giza have stood the test of time for over 5,000 years. They have stood in wonder and wondered what the hell is going on over there. And after 10 years of research, I can tell you, they are magneto-hydrodynamic hydraulic control system devices that create, modify, and distribute hydrogen ionized plasma product into the global electrical circuit. Giza stands 60 feet above the crust of the Earth in North Africa. North Africa is right on top of the major armature, the geo-electric uh, armature of the planet. It was placed there, I believe, for this very purpose of stabilizing the magnetic field and stabilizing the pole so it don't slip again. It's done this over a hundred times. It just hasn't been us any of those times except now. And it hasn't come yet, but it's coming. There, um, there's a uptick in volcanic activity and uh, catastrophic weather events happening more often, more intense, more frequently, and in odd places they didn't happen before. There's a way, I believe, and this is not a Hail Mary, this is more of a scientific long shot. If we had enough people, uh, money to throw at this and do a computer simulation to find out what a magnetohydrodynamic uh, setup like that would do, then we could perhaps replicate what it does and save ourselves from drowning. That's my mission now. Anybody a civil engineer here? We're building a team. <laughs> okay, well. That's what I'm working on. That's what I'm working on. And uh, if you could throw a prayer that way so that uh, the people that can make a difference will make a difference before it's too late. And other than, uh, now outside of that, I do have uh, a number of artistic projects. Um, the Perspectives Enhancement Project is yeah, something I was working on with an acting friend of mine, an acting coach. And uh, he does stand-up comedy and has been teaching stand-up comedy for 40 years. And we were working on a, a, a way to have a new acting class for the new age. And we were looking for systems and we found that Albert Einstein had a wonderful system. He worked with the theatrical scenario. It is called in thought experiments, and it would be essentially shaped just like a scene, you know, in a world where people dream of starship technology. The question remains, how could you tell the difference if you saw it? 
And that's my challenge to any, especially civil engineers, about the pyramids of Giza. It's all there. They've been there. I mean, it's been there for all that time. We just hadn't had the knowledge base. 1950 is when magnetohydrodynamics was kind of discovered. That's just really around the corner for science. Love me. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so it's not surprising that people haven't like gotten to this point. I've had 10 years to do it. No one's really had that much time to throw at it. And I was also using Einstein's Oculus, which is uh, the way he set up his imagination to work as a tool for creativity. And that's essentially what my writing partner, uh, Samuel Cox, was uh, were working for, is how you can use your creativity to create what you want and need in your life. One of the things I think that's wanted and needed among humans, apparently, on the planet, because it looks like a lot of angry people everywhere, yeah. is uh, how do we deal with that, right? And uh, that is... Yvonne Agazarian developed a system of psychology called system-centered training, which is based on living human systems. And living human systems gather together to survive, develop, and transform. What do they transform? It is their way of thinking so that the behavior transforms and they end up transforming their physicality. Let's take your wolves and your foxes they were selected for their affinity toward friendliness to humans. And you can hardly find a dog that looks like a fox or a wolf now. They, they change their selves. Yeah. They transform themselves through their, what they believed, what they felt. I like humans. Yeah. They feed me. <laughs> they, whatever they do. And so, um, so here's what happens with living human systems. They gather together around similarities and they go apart in differences. And if differences need to be integrated, how do you do it? I was never clear on that until I worked with Sammy. Humor. Humor is what integrates weirdness. You take some kind of impossible setup or a normal setup and then you change it on the punchline. So that's a transformation. So people practice their joke telling will be real good at finding a way to, ha to make uh, humor about something kind of evil coming their way. That's just so we don't go crazy with fear and that we can rip and tear with laughter if we need to. Um, so that's what I like to do is get folks together and uh, peace, you know, love, rock and roll, like from the 60s, we're back again. And we were right. Everything we said back then about the military industrial complex, mm-hmm, it sure is. Mm -mm -mm. So, um, the deal is, we can get on the same page. I think we tried to do that in the 60s and 70s with the, the songs, right? Everybody knew the same song, knew the same lyrics, we're on the same page. Let us go forward and multiply and uh, prosper. Well, that's where I'm going, that's where I'm heading. Dang, it's another exciting adventure into who knows what. Yeah. Come on, Galaxy, bring it! Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's the perfect way to end this. I got nothing to follow up with that. Thank, Thank you, you for letting me talk about Very that. much, That's Phil. not a, usually a horror topic. <laughs> I loved it. Thank you, sir. Can we get a picture of you? Can we get a picture of you? Oh, yeah. Whoa. Thank you.